And now, uh, my great honor to introduce um, our mayor of the city of Spokane, Mayor Nadine Woodward. Nadine was born and raised in Washington State. She's an award-winning broadcast journalist, mother, business owner, and proud Spokaneite. She's a champion for public safety, housing, homelessness, economic development, and mental health advancements for Spokane. She's twice been invited to attend the prestigious Yale Mayors and CEO College and led the unanimous passage by the U.S. Conference of Mayors of three separate resolutions supporting additional federal funding locally for community policing, mental health, and fentanyl prevention and enforcement. She established a mental health task force of regional behavioral health professionals to address the needs for youth and sits on the SAFE task force for fentanyl awareness and education. She's the 45th mayor of Spokane and the fourth woman to hold the office. Please give a warm welcome to our mayor, Nadine Woodward. Well, thank you all for being here today for the annual State of the City Address, especially those who powered through the cold morning to get here, thank you. And uh, Pastor Watson and Sydney, thank you for blessing today's event with your prayers and talent. Um, it's one of the best parts of the program, I think. So anyway, thank you so much. We are excited to share with you today the things that we've been working on to move our city forward. Uh, my cabinet members who are here and their teams have achieved many great advancements in public safety, housing, homelessness, economic development, mental health, and other critical areas that makes us safer, more secure, and a sustainable city. So could I get my cabinet members to please stand up? I know you weren't expecting this, and department heads too, because I tell everybody a mayor cannot do this on her own. It takes a team, and I am so thankful to have such an incredible team. Thank you for all you do. To frame our conversation today, um, I want to share comments that a community member shared with me recently. She was part of a small group of neighbors who came to my office to talk about ideas and feedback on their observations and experiences uh, in the circles that they travel. And as a relatively uh, new nurse in her career, she was by far the youngest in this group. The others were retired and they were focusing their time on, on volunteer opportunities, which she was able to still fit in around her full-time job. Besides a deep passion for the neighborhood that they live in, in the community that they love, the group had one thing in common. Each one of them moved here from a different city and state. They were drawn to Spokane for its beauty, biking, hiking, seasons, our walkable downtown, easy airport access to visit family, and friendly people. They arrived in Spokane with years of civic engagement in their previous communities and quickly started thinking about how those experiences could be relevant in their new home of Spokane. When it was time for the young nurse in the group to speak, she paused and said, there's not a lot of hope. For the next few minutes, she provided more context to that statement. She talked about working as a nurse in the jail before moving to an organization that provides underserved youth with the direction and supports most of them are lacking. She found this new job more fulfilling and a way to really make a difference. There's been a lot of devastation in the world lately, she continued, and she wondered how anyone can be successful in our current global environment. She was talking about financial stability, home ownership, achieving personal and professional goals, she considered herself lucky to finish her studies at Whitworth and WSU with modest, yeah, yes, <laughs> with modest debt compared to her friends. Yet now in her mid-20s and in a job that she absolutely loved, she was still overwhelmed about what the future may hold for her and those around her. There's no hope across many generations, she continued. Her comments were equal parts, I'll just say, heartbreaking, insightful, and inspiring. Heartbreaking because hopelessness can spiral into desperation. Insightful because in those few minutes she captured the sentiment of so many people. After what our community has experienced the past couple of years. Inspiring because instead of giving up, instead of retreating to her work or the isolation of her home, instead of blaming or saying, that's somebody else's problem to solve. She asked herself, how can I help? And then she acted. She got involved in her neighborhood, surrounded with the people 
in her neighborhood who have a similar sense of community, bonded with neighbors who have enough experience with community engagement to know that individually they don't hold all the answers, but collectively they can make a difference. So they began talking. They shared their backgrounds, their dreams for community. They built from the strengths that they saw in the neighborhood and their daily activities and looked for opportunities to improve what they saw around them. For these four neighbors, public safety, housing security, and mental health were right at the top of the list of the things that were important to them. They wanted to make sure that people feel as safe as they do when they move around the community and enjoy recreation, arts and entertainment, dining, and all the other activities that they enjoy. They also acknowledged two things. First, not everyone shares the same feeling of safety. And second, property crime is not where they want it to be. They were also concerned about housing inventory from a safe and consistent place for the unhoused to someone just entering the housing market to keeping someone currently in housing from being priced out. Their ideas range from some tough love for those who need it to sincere compassion for the majority who find themselves at a point in life where they just need a hand up. We've had some difficult conversations as a city and as a country the past couple of years on issues like health care, politics, policing and public safety, and our economy. Amen. Thank you. They share concern about how all of these things have impacted the mental health of our community. After about an hour of conversation, they came to the conclusion that Spokane as a community has tremendous effort. There's been progress made and so much opportunity. And despite what were clear philosophical differences on some issues, what really impressed me about them is that they listened to each other. They found common ground and respectively articulated the points that, were making, that they were making from all sides of the discussion. Divisiveness and disruption played no part in their comments or the solutions they proposed. Instead, they chose a path of working together. So their stories really got me thinking about what we've been through the past couple of years and now where we're headed. We've accomplished so much to build a more safe and secure, sustainable Spokane. And yet, as we all know, there's so much left to do. Sometimes that can lead to a feeling of hopelessness. Oftentimes, that gets lost in the wedge that people want to drive rather than the common ground from which we really do strive to build on. Our job, our duty as leaders, influencers, friends, neighbors, community members, is to do everything we can do to minimize the hopelessness and bring a bright light to the progress. It's a way to make it comfortable to work together rather than to drag each other down. <laughs> We've done a lot of listening in the community. And one, one hour of, of reflection, feedback, and conversation, these four neighbors captured what Spokane is currently experiencing and where we should all be focusing. A year ago, we pledged to work collaboratively towards solutions and outcomes that keep our community thriving and moving forward. And this year, we recommitted to that pledge, and we're more resolved than ever, that there is a seat at the table for anyone willing to set aside differences and work respectively together on the things that Spokane truly needs. That cooperative spirit is what we need. That cooperative spirit must rise above the noise and the blame. Our greatest accomplishments are achieved through uh, collaboration and compromise. Truly working together requires honest give and take, not blindly charging forward to achieve individual desires. And that must be done with respect and trust that comes without strings and devoid of retribution to be paid for any disagreement. The feedback we hear consistently focuses on the need to feel safe doing the things we all love about Spokane, to feel secure in our place and being, and to feel a sense of stability as we continue to build and grow our lives. While these four neighbors, I know I'm talking a lot about them, but they were, man, they made an impression on me. They were sharing their own experiences. They spoke volumes about the community psyche. They remind us that this is not about any one of us. Instead, it's about every one of us. They and so many of their neighbors made it clear that government exists to govern for the people, not over the people. Amen. 
And this is what we hear when we listen. The reason why I'm here in Spokane is because I love Spokane. I was born and raised here. I can't think of a better place I'd rather be. I've been all over the United States, but I serve a great God, and he's continued to bring me right here. We hear a lot of times, well, there's nothing going on for our kids here in Spokane. They say they should leave here. I'm in total disagreement with that because I believe that once you go somewhere, if you decide you want to go out of town to go to school, to me, that's fine. But come back and give back where you started. I mean, because me here in Spokane, I, uh, I just love Spokane. And in order to really help our city move forward and make progress, uh, we all need to come together. We all need to work together. We have to have similar goals in mind. And that goal is a place where our families feel safe and can go about their business without being worried about being victims. And I'm asked a lot, why is safety such a top concern? And really, it's because safety is that foundation. Once we are clean, safe, and welcoming, we can talk about these exciting things that are happening here. Spokane is an incredible community, and we have so much going on that's in our favor. Momentum is something that you have to capture in the moment. You can't control it, you can't ask for it. I think if you don't take advantage of it, you'll lose it. And, and I think we're seeing that and the city is rightly worried about that. Um, and so being able to provide good services to people across a broad area is going to be really critical to keeping people here and continuing to attract new people and new talent and new businesses and all of those things that make the community richer. The, the different business districts and have different needs inside of what they're doing and we need not to have a one-size-fits-all program and have an adaptive to be able to work. So our needs in, say, in the Sprague Union area are different from Hilliard or even Garland or, say, South Perry. The engagement is critical, and again, that's one of the things that I'm so bolstered by in this neighborhood is, is the degree of engagement and the degree of caring and how many people are willing to, to step up and do the work. It's not easy work. Sitting in commissions until six or seven at night on a weekday is not easy and it takes you away from your family and your business and all of that, but it, it's, it's necessary and I continue to be encouraged by the amount of, of that buy-in that I see. Collaboration <laughs> is key because you got to be able to communicate. When you can have positive dialogue, you can make things happen. Steady, you know, you get into a meeting and you, uh, it's self, it's self. You got your, it's all about self. We need to take self out of it, see, where we can help somebody else. Because when we start thinking about somebody else and hearing about their problem, it makes our problem seem very, very minute. I think one of the great things about our community and the people who I work with is a, a passion to make our, our community safer. And the people who I work with, uh, they understand the limitations that they are experiencing and have to work in, but that doesn't uh, dull or blunt their passion and their desire to help their community. We as a community need to address every single one of those issues while saying we want clean, safe, and welcoming right away for everyone in our community to enjoy. We need to start standing up and loving more, taking self out of it and loving more. We can do that as a people. My favorite saying is, when we can come together collectively as a people, green, black, white, we got a beginning. When we can stay together, we have progress. But when we can work together, we got success. It's a win-win for us all. Thank you, Michael Brown from Fresh Soul and everybody else who was uh, in that video for their honesty and vulnerability. Um, you heard some fundamental needs expressed there. And, and I always, the more you listen, the more you appreciate the power, conviction, and the vision in their stories. They want us to engage perspectives and to dedicate resources to deliver critical outcomes for our entire community. Public safety is a top priority. Everyone we talk to, every meeting we go to, every neighborhood we visit, public safety is the topic of discussion. 
personal safety is essential to the choices uh, we make as to where we live, where we work, where we pursue our passions. Because of that, Police Chief Craig Meidel and I made a commitment to increase public safety through a law and order approach. We heard from neighborhoods and businesses, individuals and organizations, and officers themselves about their strong desire to continue to improve how we serve. The feedback was consistent. People want more officers on patrol in their neighborhoods. They want to know the officers on patrol in their neighborhoods. And they want greater responsiveness to all levels of calls. The decisions we've made reflect that feedback. We've committed more resources to the things that support prevention and address root causes. Like opening police precincts in the downtown and East Central neighborhoods that advance the community policing model and puts officers closer to the people they serve. We're several weeks into a new staffing model that puts more police on patrol in neighborhoods. Officers are assigned to work in one of four designated areas of the city, giving them responsibility and ownership for the neighborhoods in their sector. The model has already resulted in a new policing approach in Northwest neighborhoods based on what officers observed with recent burglaries. That analysis is guiding proactive tactics to reduce property crime. And that's exactly the type of officer-driven ideas that come from ownership of an area. And it's why SPD leadership work with officers to really listen and understand the community need. These officers shared that, above all else, they're frustrated because the community has an expectation they can't deliver within our current constraints. Officers feel like they're letting down the people they signed up to serve. So the department acted. Part of being efficient with our resources is deploying those resources to meet emergent needs. Violent crime has become a big problem in our community and in communities across the country. So we established a violent crimes task force of specially trained officers and supervisors to focus on removing prolific and violent offenders from the streets. Since becoming operational in June, that task force has arrested more than four dozen individuals identified as prolific violent offenders and actively wanted for crimes like drive-by shooting, first degree assault, and murder. The task force also works closely with local, state, and federal law enforcement partners, including a special emphasis on gang activity to make best use of all of our resources. And they're building stronger cases with the goal of getting longer sentences to keep prolific offenders out of your neighborhoods. Our partnership between behavioral health professionals and our police officers to better access, address people experiencing a behavioral health crisis has been expanded by 20%. That partnership, which includes the Spokane County Sheriff's Office, has diverted 80% of the nearly 3,700 individuals who have been contacted from going to jail or to overcrowded and costly emergency rooms. The Spokane Fire Department has a similar program with behavioral health professionals to better direct the appropriate level of care in the field and in more uh, formal settings. Our fire department has also partnered with Shrek, the Spokane Regional Emergency Communications Agency, to dispatch emergency medical and fire calls for help quicker, more efficiently, and much more cost effectively. Partnerships have become a critical part of public safety. We emphasize that with our officers when we change their staffing model. And we're asking for your help today. Much like the young nurse and her Browns Edition neighbors, we're asking all of you, please be engaged. Invite your neighborhood police captain to your next association or organizational meeting. Speak up about the tools law enforcement need to be effective in your neighborhood. Let us know what's working and what isn't. Highlight the solutions that bring positive change rather than giving more attention to the challenges before us. That's how we'll move forward as a city. <laughs> Chief Meidel and I have been regulars uh, in front of the state legislature this session, testifying in support of bills to return accountability to laws that allow drug possession in our state. We're advocating for balance and common sense that requires individual buy-in to accompany treatment. Uh, we did have some successes last year, and we're back this year working for Spokane to return more of the tools that our law enforcement need. Our community engagement tells us that we're united around the fight 
against the fentanyl epidemic plaguing our country. People are overdosing at alarming rates, and much of the violence and property crime are directed to that epidemic. Bags filled with hundreds and thousands of pills are regularly a part of arrests that also include illegal weapons and cash. And if we needed one more reminder just how harmful this deadly drug is to innocent victims, we got it about a week ago. Fire and police responded to a call of an unresponsive child during a supervised visitation. CPR and Narcan were used to revive that child who tested positive for fentanyl. That child was only 14 months old. Sadly, we have allowed our state to remove some of the very interventions that help law enforcement redirect damaging behaviors. We're working hard to get a balanced solution that meets the needs of all involved because as that example so devastatingly illustrates, drugs victimize the innocent. That's why I'm working with council members Michael Cathcart and Jonathan Bingle, thank you, they're here today, on an ordinance that would return accountability to those who openly use drugs. The community has demanded that we do something about rampant drug use that occurs on sidewalks, in parking lots, stairways, and storefronts. We'll be bringing that ordinance to the full council the next few weeks as another way to get people the help they need while respecting the use of public spaces for all of us. We're also advocating at the state level for additional funding to hire more police officers. The next phase in our new staffing model is to add even more officers in your neighborhoods, and we need the financial resources to do it. At the same, same time, we're imploring our legislature to send a strong message that property crime will not be tolerated by increasing penalties for repeat offenders. And we've joined other communities around the state in advocating for a return of police pursuits by lowering the standard to reasonable suspicion rather than the higher probable cause threshold to send an equally clear message that there will be accountability if you break the law. <laughs> Unfortunately, that effort has been met with significant opposition from a West Side Committee chair, but will continue to work for Spokane. We must reestablish the expectation that victims of crime are heard and considered <clears throat> when laws are enacted in the interest of public safety. Too often, it's the victim that's left out of the equation. And as we listen, we spent considerable time exploring and understanding the why. We wanted to know what's driving perspectives and expectations. We're told it's a vision that includes affordable housing, healthy neighborhoods, economic advancement, and a community working together to achieve at the highest level. You know, Spokane is a great community, and uh, I think the people who live here are invested and they care, and, and ultimately, no matter what your belief is and how you feel, we all want the same thing, which is to live in a wonderful community where everyone feels safe and where we can enjoy our lives. Uh, we have ample outdoor space, hiking trails, the river, our lakes, golf courses are amazing, and then we have the access to the arts. The employees going to lunch, going to dinner, going to happy hour, late night activities, theater, all kinds of vibrant civic amenities that we all know and love stem from a safe environment. When there is safety, when there's a focus on how we create a clean, safe, and welcoming environment, Spokane thrives. We chose Spokane actively amongst 16 or 18 different communities. And we've been here a little over two years now and couldn't be happier. It's, it's comfortable, it's a great size, it has all of the things you want without a lot of the things that you don't want of living in a big city. So it's, it's just a great size. And again, people care and they're friendly and they're vested and they've bought in. And, and that's just an incredible, incredible asset. Spokane never lost its mojo. It was always there. Uh, but yes, the hustle and bustle is back. I think we just need to keep investing and being enthusiastic about our city. And uh, it's just going to get better from here. I think Spokane is on the crest of something absolutely wonderful. And I am so excited for the ride and to see where it goes. So the city is moving forward and trying to find solutions because with the price of housing, you're going to need to see different styles. New generations looking at 
different opportunities to be closer to their neighborhoods, closer to their other, other friends and families. We're housing the teachers, we're housing our airmen at Fairchild. And so these new changes are going to allow those opportunities to, to come to become reality. I'm Randy Palazzo with Urban Empire Homes. Uh, we're infill builders. I've uh, been doing infill for many years. Uh, we're going to take this vacant lot and we're going to split it into three lots and we're going to build three attached homes, so three single family homes that are attached. The, the Building Opportunity and Choices for All program was passed as a response to the housing crisis. We recognized that there was a desperate need for housing. And we also recognized that there was a lot of land uh, available or that could be available for development if we adjusted our rules to, to bring them onto the market. Boca is, is a great opportunity to test some ideas, some concepts, and get the community to really buy into these ideas. Like I said, these are providing housing for our friends and our neighbors. I promised my mom I would take care of her, and in order for me to do that, it, this had to be one level. I'm taking care of her. She's not going to have to go to assisted living. She's staying with me. There's the front door. Where that window is is the living room area. What I'm really excited about with this program is that it opens opportunities for smaller developers and even for individual homeowners to get involved in resolving this crisis by building more housing. We need, we need everybody to pitch in, individual homeowners included, people like Laura Dirks. I just, I wanted my space and I wanted them to be able to have space and feel that they have a home and I have a home and there was no way that was going to happen if I couldn't get an ADU with uh, space for myself and my mom. These areas, Spokane included, just about every city you're in needs more density and Spokane opened the door to just that through Boca and I'm really proud of Spokane for opening that door even before the bigger cities on the west of the Cascades like uh, Seattle or Portland. With uh, Spokane being the flagship for this program, I really feel that other cities are going to follow because it, the density is dramatically needed. So the vision is walks in the park and sunsets from your backyard. It's housing that's affordable and available. It's taking care of each other and respecting the use of the spaces that we all share. It's enjoying dinner and a show, walking on the Centennial Trail and enjoying our beautiful Spokane River. It's short commutes and more time spent with loved ones. This is how Spokane defines community. And others have been discovering these virtues in large numbers of late. As we transition with the rest of the country through economic, workforce, housing, and mental health challenges and opportunities, we've met critical needs to emerge stronger as a community. An important next step is to reset negative self-perceptions and embrace expectations of support, accountability, and advancements that deliver peace of mind. Home ownership is the largest builder of wealth for most of us. The financial equity that grows in the home is complemented by social equity and a sense of security that comes with being part of a neighborhood. We're implementing solutions that provide greater housing accessibility and affordability. Spokane has experienced two consecutive years of record demand for residential and total construction to add inventory and help people realize the dream of home ownership and for families to evolve their housing as they grow. A city pilot, as you heard, has now become a state and a national model for multi-unit housing construction in traditionally single-family neighborhoods to open new pathways to more housing and ownership options. Those include smaller accessory dwelling units that are keeping families together and attached townhomes that make entry into the market much more affordable. These are big tools to meet the infill housing needs that our comprehensive plan has promoted for more than two decades. Spokane has achieved a 20-year high new multifamily unit to create badly needed inventory. And for those experiencing housing insecurity, we have focused a tremendous amount of resources to stabilize housing. We brought together partnerships that open and enhanced five facilities in our shelter system that meet specific needs and nearly doubled our capacity to move people toward permanent housing. 
we secured and distributed $33 million in grant funding to provide rental and utility assistance to keep people in their homes, and we did it among the fastest in the state. Building neighborhoods to maintain the characteristics that make them special while adding new amenities has been a top priority. That included expanded access to libraries through a partnership between the city and middle schools to make better use of taxpayer money and to bring resources to underserved neighborhoods. The opening of downtown's beautiful Central Library, a 21st century facility that includes media studios, a business lab, cafe, children's play area, and meeting and event space that overlooks our Spokane Falls. And improvements to neighborhoods, parks, Riverfront Park as well, has added Spokane's quality of life and reputation as a destination. These community-defining efforts were built on trust, only possible through partnerships, and create opportunities for generations to come. They are foundational and fundamental to our reemergence and revitalization. It's how we move forward as a community to a better life for our children and for future generations. My name is Chris Bovey. I own Vintage Print and Neon in Spokane in the Garland District. And I use my art to help people cherish those fond memories of Spokane. I mean, I always just kept coming back to the Garland District. And kinda, I created this idea of micro-tourism, like if you're on the South Hill and you see something from the north side of one of my prints, like you might go and explore something you'd never had before. And the more that we can support our small business owners and our shops and everything like, and our districts and everything like that, I think the better. And, and because it gives people like myself the confidence to be able to step out and try something new and try uh, being an entrepreneur in this city. That's exactly what happened to me. Came here, fell in love with the city, I've been here for 40 some years. When I first came out, I used to work for Montgomery Wars, where the city hall is now. And I was a second black salesman that they ever hired there. And I had a construction company, and then I started chicken anymore. So this is about the fourth business I had since I've been in Spokane. And all of them been successful. We got a lot of talent here in Spokane. It's got a lot of smart, intelligent, highly educated people, but you you got to use that. You got to put that in, put in action. I think it shows a collaboration that can happen to really make a difference for our community. And it's really putting politics aside and saying, what do we need to do for our community, for our citizens that are gonna help them into the future make things happen. So and that's what is beautiful about this facility is it gives them that opportunity if they need mental health help, um, if they need to, to look at medications to help them with that, it does that. If they've got a substance abuse issue, then we can help them in that area. This place made me uh, feel comfortable enough to keep going with it. And I stuck with it, I'm still sticking with it. Yeah, one of the things we're grateful for at Frontier is the support that we've received from both Spokane County and the City of Spokane, support in a number of different forms. Uh, one is just being willing to try and support new endeavors such as the behavioral health unit. Um, others are making financial investments and other forms of support, not just for mental health services, but also for the many other services that individuals who are struggling with mental health issues are reliant upon, housing, food, other resources. And not having to worry about where I was going to sleep that night or what I was going to eat. I'm grateful for the help that um, they've given me and um, just the tools that they've given me to where I can succeed. I think the mayor's done a great job in the last year. I mean, the, the amount of people that have or provided uh, beds is tremendous compared to two years ago. I mean, now we got 350. So I think it's going in the right direction. So I like what's going on in the city. Uh, the leadership, the leadership is fantastic. You know, I hope that people continue to stay engaged. I hope that the city continues to hire really good, really talented people that really care and are really excited about doing new things and capturing this opportunity. Just find that nice sweet spot and capture the opportunity that's in front of us. 
The thing that I love about this city is, like I said, they will support a crazy kooky idea like silkscreen art and uh, support a shop being open and that's why Spokane rocks. I agree. <laughs> So where do we go from here and how do we get it done? The past few years have taught us many lessons and it's given us a new launching point really. The tests that we've endured remind us that Spokane is unequivocally resilient. The result, results show us that our best outcomes are realized when we work together. The progress has directed a clear path forward in three critical areas. First, we're establishing and reinforcing a mindset that prioritizes community wellness and well-being. Our mental health has been shaken. Over and over again, community members express fatigue, frustration, and a loss of patience. We can all point to examples in stores, in restaurants, at work, maybe in our own homes, with our own families, where behavior has been altered. The uncertainty that we experience has come as a deep cost that has people craving stability instead of constant change. Moving forward, we must embrace compromise and demonstrate understanding. We have to appreciate the good to get to the great. And that starts with our youth. My Mental Health Task Force of Community Professionals is addressing the needs of our youth who have been most compromised and impact by the events of the last couple of years. We must set the example with our own behavior and build youth supports that will make them successful for the future. Our partner experts on that task force tell us that mental health has a 30% statewide vacancy rate, with nearly one third of employees leaving every single year. The result is that nearly three quarters of organizations statewide are cutting programs or reducing access at a time when we need every single resource and more, and they tell us Spokane mirrors that data. Our work as a task force includes adding staffing and space resources to help more, uh, to make help more accessible to youth in crisis. We're partnered as advocates at the state and federal level for additional reimbursement and funding to ensure that service providers can maintain and grow necessary resources. And we're bringing greater awareness to the tools and supports that are already in place to create more engagement points for our youth and remove the stigma of reaching out for help. Prioritizing community health and well-being also includes making better use of organizational and community resources. So looking inside our own city organization, we've established the Community Safety Initiative Work Group to improve our criminal justice system. In fact, we're re-evaluating how the system can work better to deliver accountability and supports to improve public safety. This involves leveraging the best of therapeutic and traditional courts, pre and post conviction services, and law enforcement and community programs to help evolve that model. The ultimate outcome is a reduction in repeat offenses and overall crime rates, and accountability to the victim and to the community. Looking upstream, we need to catch people before they even enter the system by creating new opportunities for people to build financial security, create employment options, and advance their skill sets and careers. We're looking for more partnerships, like our really great collaboration that we have right now with the Small Business Administration and AHANA on a program to provide resources to multi-ethnic small business owners. These are the types of programs that lift community up and infuse hope into dreams. Finally, we looked back and looked around so that we could look forward. Our experience tells us that the best times in our city's history share a few key ingredients. Big ideas that turn challenges into opportunities, critical community partnerships that work effectively across perceived boundaries, and the will to get it done. The city with its partners and collaborators, neighbors and neighborhoods, stakeholders and volunteers are working on three big ideas that will fundamentally change how we move our community forward. In many ways, Expo 74 put Spokane on the map. It transformed industry, established a clear regional center place that we all feel ownership of, and solidified our city's place in the region. 
That fundamental point in Spokane's history, as you all know, is about to reach, reach a milestone. In the nearly 50 years since Expo, Riverfront Park has grown and matured into a major regional attraction that continues to draw visitors, conventions, concerts, celebrations, and sporting and community events. Numerous stakeholders have now partnered around an Expo Plus 50 celebration that returns the focus to the major investments in regional attractions in our downtown. It connects an exciting arts and entertainment district to thriving restaurants, shopping, and hospitality, all with the river and the park in the middle of it all. That celebration will come together over the next year as work finishes on the new stadium. Major events continue to fill up the podium and the Spokane Arena. The Civic Theater hosts its full performance schedule, and Riverfront Park continues to grow as an outdoor venue. The region is also coming together to more effectively and collaboratively address homelessness. The city is one of several now voices in a conversation about a regional collaborative that can fundamentally change how we provide meaningful services that move people into housing faster, more efficiently, and with better success. That conversation with the help of a consultant will involve everyone who has a part in visioning, funding, supporting, assisting, moving, and connecting people to services and housing. We've spoken extensively with Spokane Valley and Spokane County about spending the next few months discussing just what a longer, more formalized engagement will look like. We're happy to share that private and nonprofit community has already stepped forward in support. And finally, we're working closely with our community partners on a regional broadband effort in bringing new investment to connect areas with the greatest economic and eco uh, educational opportunities for growth. It's a generational opportunity to build greater technology equity and also economic advancements for generations to come. I'm just telling you right now, Spokane has so much going for it. And we're taking the steps together to embrace the opportunities before us and rise from our new launch point. Community is about more than any one of us. It's about all of us. The lessons we learned over the past years and that that our Browns Edition neighbors so eloquently captured reminded us of that. The words we heard today from our community members in the video confirm it. Our challenge today as a region is to embrace the progress, to grow the opportunities, and thrive through the power of partnership. Thank you all for being partners with us.